Just texting the microphone. Does everybody hear this? Sound good? Um, it's fine. I was just testing the microphone. comfortable for you. And then if you want to clip this, you know, up. Go ahead, you can clip it wherever you want to clip it. You want, can you run this up your shirt and... Is that what you again? prefer? Okay. Looks a little better that way. Okay. Okay, cool. And then, uh, this, you can okay, okay. You want. Okay, that's awesome. Which one is it? The top one is or the, is the forward? Is a PDF. Mine's so, a PDF. So yeah, yeah. It'll work on the PDF. Okay. It'll work for a PowerPoint. Okay. So you have to do it the old manual. So I'll just do it here on this arrow, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll need full screen on this. So um, yeah, that's, um, that's what you'll see right there. Well, this is all I can get. Oh, you need full screen here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thanks, man. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Do that. What's your name? Oh, my name's Frank. I'm Frank, sorry. nice to meet you. I'm Wes. Thanks for your help. No problem. Anything, let me know. Will do. Hey, so I emailed Brian Bell. I haven't heard back on that thing, but I'm going to see him this weekend, so I'll bug him on it this weekend as okay. well. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Is Tim with you? Tim's not going to be with me because okay. he's presenting at the same time. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know. We can turn... Here. Not me. Not, I'm not using any of them. So I'm just, I'll probably just stand like this. Is Tim Gray also presenting? No. You? No, it's just going to be you now? Just me. Yeah, because he's presenting in another session right now. Okay. okay. People can use these chairs if they want. Maybe we'll keep one for the other presenters. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. We can turn down the lights if we want to as well, Joe. If you want. It's up to you. Is that too dark? Is that good? Sorry? Ah, to see me? Ah, right, 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 right. You know that's so important to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
instructions. Uh, we are recording uh, the session today and they will be able to be streamed and that has a little bit to do with the screen. So if the screen quality is not what you're used to, uh, that has a little bit to do with the technology that we're using at the moment. So don't blame the presenter. Uh, I have been given very specific instructions on keeping the time going uh, from the dean himself. Yeah, so the schedule is we are going to have 20 minutes for presentation, and I will for our, our presenters, I have time, time to, uh, to give you a hint. Uh, but the, the goal is 20 minutes for a presentation, 5 minutes for a question and answer, and 5 minutes to switch my with presentations and, and those sorts of things. And so that if you choose and you want to go to other presentations, we will try to end so that everybody starts on the hour or the half hour. Does that make sense? So without further ado, and we'll go see if we can find some more chairs in a second. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Wes Gant, <coughs> professor in architecture, who will be presenting uh, some of his research findings uh, and work uh, in Sri Lanka. So with that, I'll give you Joe, thank you so much. Thanks for everybody to everybody for coming. Um, I'm Wes and uh, Tim Gray. Most of you know Tim. Tim's presenting in another session um, right now, so he won't be able to join us. Talia Mulvihill is a faculty member in education studies. Um, she's across campus, so she's not here either. And uh, the, the little talk I want to give today is about some of the work that uh, um, some of us have been doing over in South Asia, specific to Sri Lanka. Um, uh, just a little bit, if you don't know anything about Cap Asia, it's a unique field study program that goes every other spring semester to South Asia. Mm, 100 students, people from other universities. Uh, it's just finishing up this week in South Asia. Uh, Tim and I and Olin were over there. Nihal Pereira is uh, uh, an inspiration for me, incredible good friend of mine, and he's the director of Cap Asia. We've worked on it together for about eight years, and I'm the co-director of Cap Asia. Um, we've done five Cap Asias, and uh, we typically ground ourselves with a, a, a very high quality, um, high profile university in South Asia to do work at for about seven weeks. Then we do shorter projects for about two weeks. This is Tim Gray. He just showed up. He's here. What's going on, man? That just took 10 seconds of, my, of our time to, to do that with you. So we're going to go right to Sri Lanka. We don't have much time, okay? So um, if you, I don't know if you know much about Sri Lanka. It's a, a country a little bit bigger than the state of Indiana. About 19 million people um, live in Sri Lanka. Olin? What's going on? Okay, okay. And um, Sri Lanka um, was hit, as was much of the Indian Ocean region, by the tsunami that hit on December 26, 2004. That tsunami wave, basically a 30-foot wave by the time it got to Sri Lanka, a 30-foot wave, okay, a 30-foot wave, um, came in from about here and hit the, all the way up to the uh, northern part of the country on the east side and down around probably a little bit farther than um, Colombo up as far as Nagumbo, which is where the airport is. Um, Hambantota, for example, is a city of 40,000 people. 10,000 people were killed by the tsunami in Hambantota. Um, to, we've been doing some work in a very small village right here named Kalamatia that I'm going to talk about a little bit today. And Tim, you can jump in here anytime that you want. Tim's been there twice. Um, and Olin uh, just is back from uh, visiting Kalamatia in Sri Lanka as well just a week ago, right? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about that. The, um, Tsunami came in on uh, December 26th, the day after Christmas, 2004, and in Sri Lanka alone, um, 32,000 people were killed. That number's maybe a little bit low. It's hard to get an exact count on this. When I visited in um, uh, March of 2005 and drove a along that southern coast highway, um, about a six-hour drive, this was the landscape that, that uh, you saw everywhere. Thousands and thousands and thousands of tents, uh, tent cities had been set up very quickly. Um, 82,000 houses were destroyed in Sri Lanka. 82,000 houses, and almost a million people were displaced by the tsunami. They needed shelter. They needed some place to live. 
Um, Kalamatea is the village that we got involved in as part of Cap Asia. Um, Nihal and, and uh, I uh, uh, found, uh, uh, through some architect friends of ours, a small project that was being started. This is this, oh, that's a very bad image. Um, this is a beach. These are palm trees. These are trunks. Uh, uh, there, okay, and uh, uh, that says Kalamatea. Uh, so uh, this was a Kalamatea was a village of uh, um, 30 families, okay, and 190 residents were living in that grove of palm trees on the ocean for many, many generations, fishing families. 30 families, 190 residents. Um, 11 people of the 190 were killed by the tsunami. Right, and uh, when we were there in 2005, we were doing just a little bit of photography of the um, old village. The title of this uh, paper and presentation is a uh, partial title is a new village in Sri Lanka. Um, because of various legislative reasons and other sorts of real estate deals going on, um, the government wouldn't allow people to build close to the ocean again, so they couldn't rebuild their village. They were, uh, a new site was found four kilometers inland, about two and a half or three miles inland, and this was that site that was leveled. Um, it was a jungle, a low, a low jungle that was leveled by bulldozers to create enough room to build a new village for, for 30 families. Um, this paper uh, 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 was, an, was an opportunity for me to look a little bit more critically at this uh, uh, thing that we do on field studies and what we call immersive uh, learning and immersive education here at Ball State. As Tim and I started writing the paper, it became pretty obvious to me that we could tell a lot of good stories. We could feel, feel really good about the work we'd done there. The students had amazing experiences, but I wondered if there was a way to be more critical of the sort of work that we do so much here at Ball State, in fact. Can we develop a critical framework or perspective to look at field studies and field trips and design builds and all the work we're doing in Indiana, in Muncie, in Indianapolis, in the United States and around the world and say, can we do better work? Is some of this work better than others or not as good as others? How do we get sharp about all this good energy that we have for all this work? Right? And so um, Talia actually gave us some things to read about autoethnography. Right? And so we started trying to get more reflective on our participation in this kind of work in building a new village in a place like Kalamatea, Sri Lanka. But beyond that, and words we can talk about there are positionality, um, involvements, and experiences. Right? But the more interesting to me, in fact, is this notion that there's a subordinate group. Right? We come in there from the first world, let's just say, and there's a third world group, and we're going to sort of dominate them with our knowledge and our energy, right? And um, so I get interested more in how does that group of people that's supposedly going to be subordinate, how do they push back against the dominant group? How do they push back? How do they resist? How do they make their own space within this bunch of energy that we could be bringing in ourselves into their lives? How do they make their own space, right? And how do they keep us out of that space or make us negotiate that space with them? So, learning lessons there, right, if that's the kind of framework. I'm just going to talk about five things very briefly that Tim and I kind of um, started seeing as we put together our images. Uh, first, I'd say the first lesson is about waking up, right? And that's, these are very basic kinds of ideas here. Um, this is the um, auspicious moment when we're beginning the groundbreaking ceremony. I think we were there in Sri Lanka and Kalamatea at a time when the local villagers themselves were waking up. It's a long-term waking process for them. When a wave wipes out your village, maybe takes away most of your family members and kills them, you're, you're going to go through a period of, of sleeping and maybe waking up and, and an in-between kind of state for a long time. So we were there, I think, when they were waking up at this groundbreaking moment when we were going to start the construction. They were going to start the construction of their new village. So for, I think, the Sri Lankans and, and the locals, it was very much a, a waking up moment that we got involved in. And I think for our students, it was a waking up moment as well um, uh, uh, to participate in actually beginning a new a life for a small group of people was powerful for them, as I think was the notion of, of the kind of privileged lives that dominant groups can live 
uh, 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 and what is the place of that when you're in someone else's world and someone else's culture. So I think that was a real strong waking up, and that uh, Tim uh, came up with that waking up idea. So uh, um, Not knowing, I think, is another kind of important idea for us on this project in terms of the lessons. Uh, Tim here, and, and uh, Tim, and Jeremy, and um, Sean, and Nihal, and Rob, and Paul, they're watching this man in bare feet with a tool that's probably centuries old do a heck of a lot more work than any of them could possibly do at that particular moment. So we were learning a lot from the local villagers about their lives, about how they work, about their own culture, and about their own knowledge base. Um, in a different way, at times, uh, many times during the course of, Tim and I would just be laughing at the construction site because trucks would just be showing up and dumping stuff all over the place. And no one could tell us where these trucks were coming from. No one seemed to be talking to the driver. Stuff was just showing up. And we got the sense that even the locals, of course, at times don't know what's going on around them. Just because they're local doesn't mean they know, right? Living now became, I think, very important for us as well in terms of a lesson. Um, this is the, um, um, we're looking inland now from that um, uh, uh, grove of palm trees. The wave hit that village in those palm trees, washed most of the buildings and all of their contents into a lagoon that you see in the background that's about a quarter to a half a mile away, right? And so the first thing we did when we got to, to, to the village was we helped, uh, we spent a day um, there picking up the remnants of the old village, trying to get that organized so it could be thrown away or uh, preserved or things could be found. And I think that notion of really quietly helping people pick up their lives that, are, that have in, in essence been tossed completely um, was, a, was a kind of a, another one of these wake up moments where we were living then. Right? And uh, Matt Johnson is, was a fantastic student in the urban planning program here, and he's a big, strong guy with tremendous energy, and he could dig and all day long. But there was always the case that you'd see Matt kind of running across the construction site then at other times being followed by 15 kids playing tag or trying to catch him or some crazy thing like that. And I think Matt, in a way, I don't know if anybody knows Matt, but Matt found himself on this trip, I think, in that, in that powerful way. Uh, living in that particular moment was one that sort of channeled his energies in ways he hadn't imagined before as a young person. Defining success, maybe this should be redefining success. Um, before we went, uh, Nihal uh, uh, and I thought that we were, were our, our goal was to try to complete a demonstration house so that the other 29 families could look at that house and maybe alter the plans or the designs of the um, of, of their own house that would be built in the future. We click, quickly ran into uh, 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 many interesting cultural issues about how a job site's organized in Sri Lanka, how the Masons organize themselves, um, and, and, and other sorts of issues that immediately caused us to understand that we weren't going to complete our goal. We weren't going to get to live out our intentions. We weren't going to finish what we started. It wasn't going to be our project that way, as we like to think about projects and completing and all these good things we have that way. So the notion of success had to be completely rethought by us. So now, instead of trying, then, instead of trying to finish one house, we decided we were going to try to get all 30 houses started. And that would be our contribution, to get everybody going and not just one done. Um, and, and, and in some sense, we didn't have any choice, you know, because it, it didn't matter if we wanted to finish this one house or not. So that was, I think, a, a powerful moment for Tim and I in terms of defining, redefining success and having interesting conversations among our students as well about what does it mean to start, to be a catalyst, to begin something with someone else. Um, here, um, uh, uh, this would be awkward for Nihal. He wouldn't like me to say this about uh, him, I don't think. Uh, he's such a great friend of mine. But we were just le leaving here, and again, I apologize for the quality of this image. Um, but Nihal here is, is saying goodbye to the mason who was running the entire village reconstruction project here. And in this bag are Nihal's shoes that he's given to this man. Uh, because the man needs a better pair of shoes. And Nihal didn't need his shoes anymore because he had shoes back in his hotel room. And um, he was gonna, he'd be fine just using those shoes. So I think in a, in a, in a way for Nihal, this was an incredibly powerful um, week that we spent on this job site for him to connect back with the Sri Lankan people that he's a part of and disconnected from as well because he's living in Muncie, Indiana with his family. So I think this notion of success for Nihal was different uh, as well. In, in, in ways that are probably very hard for him to articulate. In fact, the, the spiritual connection was, was so strong for him at, at that time. 
And finally, in terms of the five lessons, um, the fifth is a powerful one, I think, both for Tim and me. It's, we, we call it shifting innovation. Um, it's usually the case that, as Sheila Kennedy says, we believe innovation happens in a one, two, three way. That we in the number one world, the first world, we give our innovation to the third world. Right? And Kennedy says that that might not translate very well and that there might be interesting um, things to learn in, uh, in other places of the world as well. So um, I'm interested, very interested, Tim to Nihal very much as well, in trying to understand what sorts of lessons we can learn from other people and what does it mean to be a student in someone else's world. This is a longer story, but this is in a way, uh, sorry, Tim figured out that there was a detail that wasn't being built quite as good as it could be built by the Masons. So in our week of time there, we decided to, that we needed to sit down and talk to the architect and then talk to the Masons, talk to the Masons, and try to explain to them that they needed to put a mechanical connector between the granite foundation that we were building and the concrete bond beam that was going to be poured on top of it. And this is me having, I don't even know how to say hi in Sinhalese. And I don't think any of these men knew how to say hi in English. So we're trying to have that conversation because it's something that I needed to, Tim and I needed to communicate. And Tim said, you do it. I'm just going to take some pictures. <laughs> it's Tim Gray. Uh, uh, Sharing lessons here. So uh, the second half of the paper that's going to just be presented very quickly is, work, uh, is, 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 is asking, did we bring lessons back from Sri Lanka, from that project, and are we applying them, trying to incorporate them here in the work that we're doing? Tim uh, uh, is awesome, and he was invited to do a, a, a two-week project uh, in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada, about two years ago now, right? 2006, and um, if I could uh, uh, say, say this, we, we put it in the paper, um, Tim and I had a conversation before he left to go to Canada. He said, what sort of advice did I have for him? I said, uh, uh, I think you should go to Canada and have a great failure, right? Because Tim does incredible work here. It's all incredibly well done. Students are always engaged in, in amazing ways. The buildings are always under control. The projects, they appear to be at least. And, uh, uh, and I said, go up there and nobody will know. Who even knows where Halifax is? Go up there and try something different, you know? Practice maybe not knowing. Practice maybe waking up. Practice living now. So see what these things mean to you um, uh, up, up there. And, and if it doesn't work, uh, no one will find out. And, and uh, Tim came back and, and, you know, and said in, in some ways that this is, if, if not his most uh, uh, successful, uh, uh, certainly among the, most, the projects he feels best about that he's done in a recent bit of work that he's done. And, and I think it was this notion of, um, he, and I think Tim would say too, sorry, Tim's here, he could talk, but you know, I'm on a roll. So, uh, um, but this notion, I think, of showing up for dinner one night there and, and everybody else who was going to be leading student uh, design build projects had plans, had designs, had funding, and Tim had his welder in the back of his pickup truck, you know, and, and didn't know and didn't have a plan and didn't have a design figured out ahead of time. And coming out of that was a project he felt incredibly good about, as did all the participants. Um, and maybe there's something there that we need to hold on to, this notion of not always having things figured out. Um, for me, uh, 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 some of you know, I've been involved in consulting up in Flint, Michigan. Um, Flint's, um, Flint's falling. At best, Flint is drifting sideways right now. They're tearing down about five to seven houses every day in Flint, Michigan. There's probably 10,000 abandoned houses in Flint, Michigan. Um, 8,000 in Indianapolis, at least, by the way, right now. Um, they asked me to consult with them on how to tear down these houses and to, 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 ask the, to try to figure out if anything could be retrieved from these houses before they're torn down. Um, Flint is a place where you come to understand quickly that the architecture profession is an economic thing, right? And uh, we only get involved when there's developers, as you just saw if you attended Craig Hartman's uh, presentation. Um, in Flint, there's no development. They don't issue new building permits. There aren't any houses really being constructed. So um, you really have to uh, find a whole new way of working. You have to let go a lot and admit that you don't know very much at all in an environment like that. Um, Nihal and I went back to Kalamatea, now to sort of come back to Kalamatea in Sri Lanka. We went back about six months later after we were there the first time and were stunned and so happy to see so much construction progress had been made. Um, Nihal just is emailing me this week. Uh, the Cap Asians are, 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 are wrapping up their uh, field study. We've had a team of uh, four students um, working in Kalamatea interviewing local residents. 
We're trying to figure out with, this, with the local people what's gone well for them. How have they been key participants in their own recovery processes, um, both independent of and resistant to larger uh, uh, recovery uh, efforts and larger groups, international aid organizations, and many others. How have the people made their own way? What's going well in, in, in their lives that they've been instrumental and important authors of both, again, resisting, pushing back against the dominant groups and making their own space for their own recoveries, right, for their own recoveries. Um, we're finding just the simplest kinds of things there, that uh, the architect is a great friend of mine, and, and, and Olin and, and, and Tim know him well also, Madhura Prematalika, completely blew the, the notion of kitchens and propane usage in the new houses, so that all of the people have now built shacks, huts, little houses, independent of their, their main house, where they're again cooking with firewood, which is what the women prefer to do there. They didn't want to use the propane that the architect thought would be best for them, and they couldn't afford to, to, to purchase it as well. I think both for Tim and I, because we have some investment there, um, there was other sorts of learning that happened. This man, Manoj, asked Nihal and me to place the cornerstones of his house, um, and this is a great honor in their society. And when we went back again a couple months, uh, a month ago, we found out that Manoj is, um, hasn't worked since the tsunami and he's um, uh, drinking a lot. So um, he's, has, has a, 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 he's drunk uh, most of the time. Um, and Rasika is a woman that I came to use as a kind of touchstone for me in terms of a community leader in this small village. And um, she lost a one-year-old baby in the tsunami, so about a year ago I was really happy to find out that she was pregnant and going to have another baby. And when Tim and I were there a couple weeks ago, um, we found out that the baby she's had, we had to see the baby, I don't know the baby's name, uh, but uh, he has a Down syndrome. And Rasika blames the anxiety of the tsunami for the, for the Down syndrome of the baby. And that's probably not, there isn't probably a connection there, but in her mind, um, there is that connection. So it's to go back to a place like this is, is, is not obvious to go back. And, and, and again, we're still not knowing. We're still learning. We're still sort of trying to, we're still getting these lessons given to us by, the, by, by what's happening in the village in, in very powerful ways, I think, both for Tim and me and now for Olin. Just to wrap up, this is the last slide. Um, I think what's important, uh, especially important for Nihal and me and Tim, and I think Olin as well, in the different work that we do that we come together uh, uh, to work on as well, is this notion of participating in people's processes. We're trying to start our work as architects and planners and landscape architects and designers, the work that we do with our students on Cap Asia. We're trying to first pass it through the lives and the realities and the real conditions of the people who, who live in these places. That, that we're interested in, and if they want to invite us to participate in their processes and make a contribution, we're happy to do that. But really we're trying, as Nihal would say, we're really trying to shift our vantage point to see the work that we're going to do through their eyes, um, uh, uh, first and foremost. So maybe, maybe the big questions here are, um, who's the building educator now in a project like this? Who's the building student in a project like this, and what's the building community? How do you define it? in a project like this. And maybe these questions for me are, are, the, are, are personally the biggest lessons I've gotten out of doing work like this, which is sort of putting all this into question in a very different way. That's it for me. Yeah, Harry. Uh, uh, well, Nihal's a Sri Lankan, and he's an architect and an urban planner and, and done significant amounts of work there, so he's knowledgeable that way. Um, our, my first trip to Kalamatia was my uh, fifth tri fourth trip to Sri Lanka, but we, we relied on local, uh, local architects to be the people that would have the local knowledge, and Madhura Prematalika had been desi designing a resort for the property right next to where the village was. So he knew all the people of the village because he'd made that his goal. So. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, I was relying, we re relied on Nihal's knowledge but, as a Sri Lankan, but we also relied on having an architect who knew the people really, as, really well, in fact. So, um, uh, but I wouldn't claim to have had any significant knowledge myself. Well, the reason I ask that, because sometimes it's an advantage.
Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think we're trying to figure out, um, you know, with a lo uh, as I said, Madura made some fundamental mistakes with his designs. Even a local Sri Lankan architect isn't going to really understand, can't, has a difficult time understanding all these dimensions. Um, Nihal as well ran into significant things that he didn't, an didn't anticipate. So I think as you say, and as I tried to allude to, sometimes the locals themselves don't even, don't, aren't aware of their own processes, right? In a way that can help them or help others. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a real good question actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could I, could I just add real quick, uh, uh, sorry, uh, but that was a great presentation. I, uh, I have lots of things I could uh, add, uh, uh, and it was a great experience for the students and, and me going over to Kalamatea. I kind of wish my presentation was paired, because what I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about builds on the, the presentation that Wes just gave, but it's going to be going on in room 101 at 11.30, so if anybody's interested mm -hmm. in in uh, seeing a little bit more about the, the project uh, mm -hmm. in Canada mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and hearing a little bit more about this work uh, uh, that will be going on upstairs. Right, great. Olin also is going to be talking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we'll be at also 11.30 and 2.02 talking about uh, ethics and professional practice concerns. Uh, with respect to Cap Asia, I just wanted to add that as far as successes and failures and, and, and presumptions and and other uh, issues that we deal with, oftentimes we have clients that are in between us and the people. Uh, mm. Especially if we're doing uh, community development type work, I think everyone here can, can uh, vouch for that. And, uh, we have these NGOs, non-government organizations, that are representing uh, the interests of the people, supposedly. And oftentimes they have a vision that's not necessarily consistent with those of the people uh, that, that we're trying to help. And we can see the resistance that was uh, alluded to in some of the uh, additions and modifications that people have made to the homes. So uh, sometimes it's difficult to determine how you go against a client when the client is in between you and the people. Uh, we would deal with that with housing authorities and other institutions all the time. So that's going to be an ongoing challenge as you uh, engage in community development type work. So I'm going to make a note of that. Great lessons learned for all of us. Thanks, so, Joe. Uh, we, we happen to be one of the most popular sessions. I don't know why. Room 100 has a third the number of people we have. So this is what I like to do. While they're pushing the out, memo. And I got something here. Yeah, I got a medal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks.